And we are back, folks, on another edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider post-late signing period episode, right? One that had a high point and a couple of lows. And obviously, people would say the biggest of lows is Michigan's top recruit on the board. Uh, Nicholas Harbor wound up going to South Carolina. We will give you the postmortem on that. We will certainly highlight the addition of Cam Brandt have a broader discussion about NIL and its impact moving forward, uh, Michigan's strategy in NIL uh, and its impact moving forward. We have an update with the father of Jaden Davis who comes on live or uh, recorded, but he is a guest on this uh, episode talking about timeline, uh, reacting to Kirk Campbell. Uh, we will also talk about the, uh, the top list for Jordan Marshall. We'll talk about the commitment of Jacob Oden. So a lot to get into in this episode. Before we get started and I introduce my esteemed colleagues, I want to remind you, if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it, be sure to review it, be sure to tell all your friends about it. They can find it wherever they get their podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, you name it. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to like the video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way, every time we do another episode or have new content, you'll get a notification letting you know it also helps us grow the channel so we appreciate that with that i want to introduce my guys who are with me on virtually every every episode starting off with the return of steve lorenz steve how are you good yeah second signing day doesn't really not really what it used to be it used to be you know yesterday would have been one of the busiest days of the year for us not really the same anymore it's always kind of weird now but uh on to 2024 Absolutely. Bryce Marich, how are you? Good. I'm uh I'm excited, man. I know we just finished up this class, but we got a lot to talk about already with the next cycle. So uh it never ends. Absolutely. So let's start off first talking about the addition to the class. It was an addition we all saw coming. Uh you felt like coming off of his visit to Michigan, his official visit to Michigan, that it was a foregone conclusion. He just had to go home and think about it a bit. Uh, but Michigan flips Cam Brand, a composite four-star on 24-7 sports. A high upside guy, Steve, uh, which really fits in with the theme of this class. It is, it's a class that, as far as the, you know, the top 50 types, that the headliner types that the, uh, the analysts single out in class descriptions, doesn't have that, but you have a number of guys that, if they're developed, could wind up being in that realm, in that ilk of player, uh, because they have that kind of talent and upside. And I count, I count Cam Brandt amongst those types of players. Yep. So I think we have what six. I think we think Breon Ishmael will probably be an edge type eventually. Um, so really, six guys in this class who could have their hand down at some point in their careers. Yeah, I put Brandt, Brandt, and uh, Trey Pierce. Pierce a little less so, but but guys that Michigan's going to be able to move all along the front, right, and put in different spots uh, to succeed. So, you know, you got Brooks Barr is going to be more of your interior guy, you know, not not one tech always, but, like, much more interior. Uh, Kumba, the, the the French prospect, will be a pure edge type guy. And then uh, Eno Etta will also be a pass rusher, you know, type guy too. So, so I, I I put Brant sort of along the Pierce mold as as a guy that they feel like they want to move into multiple spots up front. You know, yeah, five potentially six guys up front again. I think it's a really nice complement to what they did in twenty two. Uh, you know, where they really bulked up in the middle, especially. So yeah, no, I mean Brant was a guy kind of quietly on Michigan's radar the entire time. I think he he was offered and then committed to Stanford not too long after Michigan made their original offer in pursuit, uh, you know, and, and, you know, kind of a guy I think they kind of kept tabs on and, and kept in touch with. Another example of a coaching change uh, benefiting Michigan at, at the end of the day, right? David Shaw leaves Stanford. I, I got to assume that had something to do with him Absolutely. eventually delaying his signing, right? So, you know, yeah, another – Michigan's done a really good job of just building on the interior uh, and building in the trenches on both sides of the football on the recruiting trail. Then you can use the, the the portal, and we've seen them do that to maybe supplement certain positions in certain spots. So, you know, 
little different than maybe it was in, in under past staffs and, 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 you know, with Michigan maybe scrambling a little bit up front, particularly in the middle. You know, I think with the Don Brown days, Michigan was really not making the interior of the defensive line a huge priority. And now you have a ton of guys there that can become difference makers and, uh, you know, create a lot of depth and rotation there. So, yeah, Brant, a very nice uh, malleable type piece for them and, and for Mike Elston. Bryce? No, I mean, Steve hit it right in the head there. Um, from what I'm hearing, he's going to be more of the Chris Jenkins spot where he fills in. We saw Chris slide, and we saw Chris slide out this past season. Um, the difference is when Chris came to Michigan, he was pretty light. Yeah, I think he was only 240, something like that, whereas Brand, he's already 260, 265. So he's got a little head start in terms of weight, but he's a guy that they like inside, outside. Um, he was committed to Stanford, so he's got a high football IQ, let alone he's just a good player or a good person in the classroom as well. He fits what Michigan likes on and off the field. And a big credit to Mike Elston. You know, this was his very first uh, recruiting cycle. And if you look at what they did up front, that might be the most impressive out of any of the coaches. If you're looking at the 2023 class out the holes, you know, at uh, Amir Kumba, Brooks Barr, Cameron Brandt, Roderick, or Trey Pierce, it's a very good group coming in. I think it's a very dement, uh, uh, I don't want to say like project group, but very uh, developmental group. And I think in a year or two, after working with like Ben Herbert and the strength and conditioning program, they could you could really see that group blossom. So this is an excellent pickup, especially late. You know, you needed something, especially with the Nick Harbor news coming. So yeah. this was definitely one you needed. Yeah, this is very much along the lines of the kinds of defensive line classes that Mike Elson was able to get at Notre Dame. I mean, you think about a guy like Khalid Kareem, who wasn't a super highly rated guy at the end of the cycle. Michigan fans are familiar with him over at Farmer local guy. Harrison. Right, local guy. He was able to take uh, and really turn him really turn him in uh really turn him into a dude. And what's my man's name that was at at uh, Skyline that moved to all those different schools? Dalen Hayes. Dalen Hayes, right. You know, yep. a high up really athletic guy was rated on athleticism but hadn't really performed a lot at the high school level when they turned him into a performer and so there my point is you took guys that did he get some some four and high four and five stars in there um sure but were there some guys who developmental wise and i throw dalen hayes even though he was highly rated in there there was some question about how good is he really because he hadn't played a lot in high school he took those guys and really made them players at notre dame and so i see a lot of that here with uh you know with cam brant i I wonder if when you put him with Trey Pierce, if, if, if it's like an either or as the big edge, because I think that Cam Brandt could be a big edge. I think, you know, maybe both of those guys wind up being, being Mike Morris capable. He's like the, you know, you, you watch him. He was a 6'5", 290 pound guy, right. To that could, could do none of these guys are Aiden Hutchinson. So he's like the unicorn. I'm not, I don't want to compare them to him, which is why I'm, I'm looking more at Mike Morris and saying, you know, if they could be that, I think that's kind of what they're looking at. If you can be a 6'6", 290-pound guy that's comfortable coming off the edge, comfortable dropping back in coverage, IQ, high IQ enough to be able to be moved around the front or the box even. I, who can forget, you know, him lining up in the middle of the defense against Penn State up in Happy Valley and blowing up the crosser. Uh, you know, on the on the fourth down up there a couple of years ago now, Mike Morris was a high IQ guy. Can one of these guys develop into that? Can both of them develop into that? And the one who doesn't, maybe he plays inside and be and becomes more of a Chris Jenkins type. You know, it just gives them more versatility. Whatever the case may be, I think both of those guys wind up being players for this team. And I put a lot of stock in what our West Coast guys say. Uh, and – they believe that this is a high upside guy. Maybe, maybe not quite as as sure as they were when they said, uh, you know, Mason Graham. Difference with Mason Graham was, man, Mason Graham dominated his senior season. Now he had, he had done, some, yeah, he had done some things in the COVID year. But you got to look at like his first four games 
of his senior season. You know, he goes into the year, he's a Boise State guy. But he was dominating both lines of scrimmage, and he was, like, leading the state in sacks as an interior lineman. And they were like, this is a guy. And, and, and mind you, wait, wait, mind you, that was in the Trinity League. Which is the toughest conference in America? That's he my was point. Doing this against that. That's my point. That's why they were more sure that it was going to translate. They were more sure that this is a dude, right? That he was tested against the top competition, and he was dominant. Uh, and he had the motor. He had all the tools. He had the size for him to go be a guy. They aren't quite. They aren't there with Cam Brandt, but they believe that he has a lot of potential to, to grow into a, being a frontline guy at Michigan with some development, which brings us to the, uh, the two misses on signing day or, or around signing day. First was Davison Igbenosin, the old Miss transfer who we were detailing quite, uh, you know, all every step of the way that Michigan was in the mix, that Michigan was going to get a visit. Uh, that they were among the the favorites to do so, that they had gotten an endorsement from Chris Partridge, which doesn't hurt, who was very, very close to this staff, very close to Jim Harbaugh, exceptionally close to Jay Harbaugh, right? And could really vouch for Michigan being a really, really good spot. Visited UCLA in the last week, then headed to Ohio State, and then headed to Michigan, Michigan being last up. And both of those schools have a real need, Steve. But in the end... He chooses Ohio State, and very noteworthy to me what he said in the comments on the Instagram post, right? He said, I be on some feed my family bleep. <laughs> he said, I be on some feed my family bleep, and I'm, I know my, my mom is proud. Now, I'm, everyone, you, your mom is proud whenever you make a decision, but when you say that on the heels of I'm on some feed my family bleep, you can infer some different things from that. I mean – Feel free to, to make some assumptions there, Steve, but I know what I assumed coming off of that. Yeah, Michigan <clears throat> didn't offer as much bleep as <laughs> Ohio State probably offered, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that. I mean, that's a it's a it's a disappointing that's a disappointing one, I think, for Michigan. I think we know one thing about Michigan; they've been very selective about who they go after in the portal uh cornerbacks a position we've kind of been keeping an eye on you know dj turner jamon green both gone uh, and while will johnson is probably going to be a preseason all-conference candidate you know i think there are a lot of question marks uh you know mike sander still also but you know you're gonna you need more than two high quality corners in today's game to to, to really uh field an elite defense so you know it remains a big question mark for michigan i think davis and the guy obviously we know would have walked in and played right away, I think, and probably been the other guy, probably been the number two guy for Michigan. Uh, you know, same at Ohio State. He'll probably be their number one guy at corner, honestly, uh, going into next year. So, you know, there's still the spring session, you know, for, for the portal as far as Michigan, if they if they want to keep their, uh, you know, eyes out on, in the portal. But, but yeah, this was definitely one because Michigan did have a couple ins, right, with, with uh, Chris Partridge departing Ole Miss. You got to know he was in Michigan's corner. In this one, and, and Davison's transfer feels like it was directly related to Partridge's um, departure from the program. So, you know, Michigan had a couple things in their favor here, but yeah, as you said, the uh, not enough bleep for Michigan in this one. So, uh, and that's the way, you know, something not the first time it's happened with Michigan on the recruiting trail, and I suspect it probably won't be the last time it happens on the recruiting trail. But, but yeah, good player. As we know, as we saw in November, Ohio State really needs defensive backs. So, uh, you know, definitely a nice pickup for them and a guy that I think Michigan definitely would have wanted for sure. Yeah, yeah but if you're if you're evaluating it on the on the merits, Bryce, both schools have a real need. I mean, the 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 spot opposite Will Johnson is wide open, and he is a ten game starter in the SEC. Uh, it's not that the opportunity is greater at at Ohio State. And you can't believe for a second you're going to get better coaching. Uh, I mean, just look at look at the performance on the field. They they were a sieve back there. I mean, Bryce Marich could have scored touchdowns on that secondary, right? I, I guess that's not the best. Uh, you, uh, well, you can score on right. the NFL. Well, I mean, I Ohio State they they can offer early playing time because, like you said, I mean, they probably just 
put on the tape and they said, if that's you, you're not getting crossed up like that. That's that's probably what they sold him. And or or, or but, also, but Michigan or bleep, could say, but Michigan could say, gave him. but Michigan could say, but yeah, you come here and you actually get developed. You actually get better. You actually perform. Right, you you actually are on a good defense and a, a good defense well, Sam, secondary. He, he he went to go and corral to eat <laughs> to feed his family. Okay, so he's you know that's the I other factor with this. You know, yeah. I mean, like Steve said, I was going to point out too is I think you have to look at the second transfer portal wave once that happens because once. The depth chart comes out for some of these schools and some of these kids see they're maybe not where they want to be. They might enter their name in the transfer portal or let's say even a coach ends up leaving or something happens. And that's kind of what happened with Davison here with Chris Partridge, you know, suddenly not on staff anymore. And he decided, I want to take my talents elsewhere. So I think Michigan is still going to look at the portal for more help in the secondary. But this is also a a sign that these young guys that are currently on the roster, this is your opportunity to go grab it. But it's who's going to take it. Is it Jaden McBurrows? Is this maybe even a Marion Walker? Is this Miles Pollard? Is this uh, Kobe Jones? I mean, there's a lot of guys that have the potential and the license and ability, like Jim Harbaugh always says, to do the job. But can they do it? And for Michigan's pursuit, for a guy like this, one makes sense because look how talented he is. But it's also a telling sign of maybe they're not comfortable with what they have in the cupboard right now. So I think they are going to look at the portal. Um, obviously, like Steve said, too, I think day one he would have saw the field. I think he was that good, too. Absolutely. And it's bottom line, this was a miss. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, but why was it a miss? Is the is what they have to evaluate. I, I think it. Right. I think it was an nil thing all the way. Uh, my my personal opinion, and which brings us to the post mortem on Nicholas Harbor, uh, who they lost to South Carolina here. And to me, this is a uh, this is a late cycle thing. I think it's directly related to nil. Uh, I think when you look back over the over the class, and and where did the class wind up being ranked? Was it 14, 13? What, what did it wind up being ranked? Michigan. Yeah. You're talking about Michigan? Michigan. I think it's 18. 18. So I wound up being 18. 18. I, I said at the beginning of the cycle, we did episodes on this, that with Michigan's NIL approach, it was kind of an open question. Do expectations have to be uh, of where their class will be? Do they have to be adjusted? I think a realistic expectation. They didn't always hit this mark, but a realistic expectation is they finish with a top 10 class, occasionally top five. But most of the time, they're going to live in a 6 to 10 range. Maybe they'll finish right outside, 11 to 12 or something like that. But with an NIL approach like theirs, the transformational over transactional, when everyone else is acting in a transactional world, does that change the ceiling for you? Do you now have to have the expectation be you're going to finish in the 11 to 25 range? That's that's the question I asked at the beginning, and now we see Michigan wind up with the 18th ranked class in the country. That's not to denigrate or disparage the guys in this class. We just spent time saying, I think this is a high upside class. I think that Jair Hill is massively underranked. No offense to our guys who do the rankings. I think I think Jair Hill is a top 50 talent, and I think that he will wind up performing at that level at Michigan. I think there's a good chance Jason Hewlett winds up in that in that range as well. But the fact remains that the guys that come in with that type of a claim, this class is devoid of that. Is this an anomaly where it just happens some years where you finish a little lower? I think the year that they got Aiden Hutchinson, who was an All-American, two sacks in the All-American game, they finished like number 22. Now he, I think, Greg Madison was a guy who knew he was going to be an NFL talent. He was completely convinced that the the analysts had missed the boat on Aiden Hutchinson, and he was right. Do they have a guy like that in this class? And is what this class – because think about it. You got Nicholas Harbor. 
Dante Moore wasn't all about NIL, but it factors in. You got uh, Jason Moore. You got what's my guy's name in uh, in St. Louis that went to Notre Dame. Uh, the tailback. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Love. Jeremiah Love. I mean, you go down the line of the top guys on their board in this cycle, and they missed on all of them. And so I think now they have to look and see, do kind of an, an honest, good faith analysis on can we compete in this space for the top talent without adjusting our NIL approach, which brings us to Nicholas Harbor for the entirety of that recruitment. And it's not like we were making things up or I was making things up telling, I was giving you exactly what they were saying. I was giving you exactly what he was saying. Hey, I'm going to get NIL wherever I go, right? Uh, that was the, the mantra, the theme, the talk uh, from, from, from dad to his track coach to Nick himself. Uh, you know, to the coaches at the school, talk to them all. We were talking to people on every level of that recruitment. But then in December, he brings in a marketing team. Uh, and it's a, a marketing team that didn't come from like Athletes First or CAA or some of the big time agencies that you, you know, you see kind of attaching themselves to the top, top guys. I don't even know if he looked at them. Maybe, maybe he looked at them and decided he wanted to go with, with someone more local and someone that his family knew, which is exactly who he wound up going with. So they come on in December, right? And then they start evaluating the NIL opportunities in January. And suddenly, something that didn't seem like it was at the forefront, it seemed like a factor in his recruitment, that's how they described it, it became an increasingly important factor as time went on. And by the time Michigan goes into the in-home, I mean, they're in that. The marketing team is in that visit. I mean, it was it was more people in, in that visit than they had had contact with up to that point. Much of that contingent made it on the trip out to Oregon as well. But still, you had people around that recruitment saying, hey, you know what? Input versus influence. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's input, right? But in the end, as, as things push towards signing day and coming off of that Oregon visit, it became increasingly clear, even to those who had been around his recruitment from the beginning, that, you know what, this NIL factor is a bigger deal than we ever thought it was going to be, maybe a bigger deal than they ever thought it was going to be. Uh, is that because the NIL opportunities became more defined? Is it because the NIL opportunities became bigger? Don't know. Whatever the case may be, it became a space that Michigan wasn't, you know, c competing on the level of some of those other schools. That is very, very clear. To the point where the marketing team, and I posted this on the board, the marketing team had its druthers. This is my opinion, and let me stress it as such. My opinion is that if the marketing team had their way completely, he'd have gone to Oregon. I mean, no one is going to out NIL Oregon, rest assured, okay? Uh, but then you get to South Carolina, and South Carolina had, you know, collectives and, and boosters and donors said, hey, you know, we're, we want to set a record with Nick Harbor. They were posting this on social media, right, signing them to a deal. So imagine – uh, a, a, a marketing team doesn't come from a CAA or, a, or an Athletes First or any of those other agencies kind of seeing a, a collective or anyone else kind of lay out an upfront opportunity. And, and I, I just use one of the tweets as an example. Look at this. We want to, you know, this kind of vehicle and this kind of money and we want to lay all of this out. And we know that that's not a space that Michigan lives in. They certainly lay a blueprint. They, they offer you a projection. They don't offer you a promise. And in a, in a competition where promises maybe are being offered, do you really stand a chance? Now, you know, it's my belief. My gut tells me, you know, Michigan, based on what they had heard throughout the recruitment, and same thing for folks who have been around that recruitment for 
the the duration duration that they were thinking, you know what, at the end of the day, the other factors are going to balance it out. I don't think that's the case. I, I think in the end, uh, Oregon was the was the preference from an NIL standpoint, but his mom had never been there. And I told you guys what he was saying about Oregon when I went to see him. I just couldn't see him going that far away to a place his mom hadn't seen, right? So that so you come back is it Maryland is certainly competing in the NIL space like that, but they aren't gonna beat out South Carolina, who he had more extensive relationships with. So if NIL was a factor, Michigan's gonna get him. If NIL is a significant factor, a big factor, a swaying factor. Michigan's not going to get him. And I think in the end, my opinion, that's the deal. That's what, what swung it away. And really, I, I, you know, I don't think for Michigan's approach being what it is, they couldn't have done anything more, especially as late in the game as this, as this occurred. I mean, the marketing team came in in December and the interactions with the marketing team happened in January. By that point, I mean, what's your pivot if you have one, right? You, you, what you're offering is kind of what you're offering, and you kind of feel like the criteria is the criteria that has been stated up to this point. The criteria, at least, or at least the perception of the criteria shifted in a huge way. And I'm talking about internally. Maybe they thought NIL wasn't going to be a big deal, Steve, and it wound up being a big deal in the end. What, what's the saying? NIL isn't a factor until it is? Maybe that's the case here, which begs the question, do you as Michigan, if you are going to compete in this space, do you have to think about changing your approach? It's a serious, it's a serious sort of consideration. And, and, and this is where I want you guys to kind of chime in and give me your thoughts. Because, you know, part of this is the spirit of what NIL is supposed to be. And I, I get it and you want to be adherent to that. But you can make choices on what lines you push. For instance, Michigan made a choice to push the line on analyst coaching, right? We know that. They just got dinged by the NCAA. And they admitted guilt. Ryan Osborne was coaching. Players said it. NCAA hit them. Michigan conceded that point. Personally, from an outside-looking-in perspective, I give less than a damn. I mean, it, it, it's so going 75 into 70. Everyone's doing that, man. Every big-time program has their analysts coaching. And if you add, and if you look at the benefit of Oz coaching, I mean, go ask Aiden Hutchinson what he thinks of Oz as a coach. Go ask David Dejabo what he thinks of Oz as a coach. And go look at those guys' production that year. I take it. And I deal with the ticket for five over in the in the 70. I deal with that ticket. I'm not saying go out and break the law, but I take my slap on the wrist for that. Why do you think you look up at the at the NCAA uh, rules committee right now and they're considering adding another on-field coach that can't go out and recruit? It's because these schools are doing that anyway. So my point is they made a decision consciously. We're going to push the limit on this. They went over the line, they got smacked on the wrist, fine. I'm not even saying break the rule on NIL. What I am saying is be very intentional about or, or consider. If you, if you assume that you're in an NIL uh, reality, that teams are working in conjunction with their collectives to figure out a way to pay players coming in the door, be very intentional about changing your strategy and your mindset to, all right, let's figure out how we can do this legally. Because I don't think Michigan is in that space for a couple of reasons. I think they're in the space of the I, this is not what NIL is supposed to be. This is not what intercollegiate athletics is, are, are supposed to be. I don't want someone coming in my locker room making a, you know, a gajillion dollars when guys they're competing with haven't made that kind of money yet. It can distort the locker room. That's the space I think Michigan is in approach-wise and ideally. And my my question to you guys is, do you think that's a strategy that they should consider adapting to the times? Because, Steve, I just don't see the NCAA 
putting the genie back in the bottle on this. As a matter of fact, I see a day where where pay for play becomes becomes the norm of the day down the line. I'm curious what you think. <clears throat> yeah, first so on first things first on Harbor, I think when Oregon got involved, I think we all knew there was no way that NIL was not going to be some kind of, I know they have a great track program and all that stuff, but there's no way that NIL wasn't going to be a factor. Um, it was clear as day that it became the factor when you're seeing Steve Wiltfong flip crystal ball, I think three times three in like times. 12 hours that there's something <laughs> going back and forth here. Right. Right. I mean, it, it, right. You, like, let's, let's be real. Um, so yeah, so that's not a race that at, at this day and time at Michigan is ever going to win. Uh, you're not going to see Michigan involved in, in a wars. three-time crystal ball flip as the phone calls are being made at the last minute to try to figure out what the best deal, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, is is going to be. You know, I think Michigan needs to do – they need to do one of two things. Uh, they either need to, to, to play hardball with it or they need to drastically loosen the transfer restrictions – to make the portal a bigger priority because we, we what we saw this off season and I think I think where Michigan could really be super could really build a a consistent level of success is through the portal because the one thing Michigan continues to do is pump out pros at a really high rate and I think kids that have already gone through the high school recruiting process I don't think the same bells and whistles that you see being recruited as a high school, I, don't, I think it's so much different when you're a second or third year guy who who knows I need to fit, I want to get to the professional level. What's the best way to do it? Michigan offers one of the one of the best paths from from a development standpoint that we've seen uh, under Jim Harbaugh. I, I think they can't continue to do NIL the way that they're doing it. But I I mean and and. You know, we've had this kind of this conversation has been going on on our board for a while. I, I think it's a lot of the same people that tout the culture that Michigan's built under Jim Harbaugh are also the ones saying we need to pay for we need to pony up for these recruits. Where yeah, I agree. I mean, maybe you guys don't or agree or disagree, but with what you said, Sam, as far as like the locker room type stuff, I don't know how people don't believe that that's a real thing. I mean, you know, right? I mean, not only are you potentially upsetting that balance i think you're naturally uh you know create you're bring, you're going to be bringing in prospects and kids that are already going to have a sense of entitlement before they even walk in the door when you're handing out large sums of money up front uh you know pretty much to come play at your school and and talk about an easy way to to, to kill this culture that you've built in the locker room you know what i think the way michigan has done it so far i think is what is the best way uh, we're seeing. Look at the guy. Look at all the guys that came back mm -hmm. this year. You think they're coming back and they're not getting anything? Like these guys are getting legitimate returns to come back, but on their own merit, I guess. Right. And so, a little bit of foresight on the prospects and their their camps, you know, thing would would go a long way for Michigan. I think if if say you know. Make you, I, I think what Jim Harbaugh say, your film is your best. What did he say that a while ago? Like your film is your best uh, marketing or, or whatever. He said something about that a while ago. But either way, I just don't see Michigan playing the the Oregon, Louisville. I think Michigan State, I think, is trying and not succeeding at it. <laughs> but just these schools that we know are, are, are really enticing kids up front. To come play football for their for their program, I think, you know, I don't know, because we know if Michigan wanted to get involved, they would have one of the best <laughs> and most lucrative pitch. I mean, what what are they the biggest alumni base in the country? Like, you know, there'd be no shortage of avenues for them to to do it. It's just, I don't know. I think as long as Harbaugh is here, I don't think you're going to ever see Michigan uh, fully go down that road. I think the the challenge is how do you find a balance? Because, right? right? So I, I that that's really my my thing, and I, I just think the portal can be sort of a, a where Michigan could really make a killing if they make it a little bit easier to, to let like a second or third year guy with all these, the transfer credits and all that stuff, it, not as big an issue as it's been. So uh, I want your take on, on this, Bryce. So I would say very quickly uh, before I give a, a more detailed response, I, I think there's nuance. Uh, you know, I, 
certainly you aren't going to go into yeah you know, when i when i talk about being more aggressive in the space you are Oregon is an extreme a and m is an extreme you're never going to you're never going to do that but is there an in between what they are or where they are and where michigan is and then you know the thing with the transfer uh, adjusting the, the the transfer um requirements is that's not an athletic consideration like your NIL approach is. Your NIL approach is an athletic an athletic department consideration. The transfer requirements are an academic consideration. And athletics can't control that. You can't they they can't adjust the requirements for for transfer credits and and admission. Uh it it, it just that is a decision that's made up on the hill and are they going to be beholden to to athletics that's a day that i don't ever see coming so i kind of think that the the requirements transfer wise or the are the requirements transfer wise uh and and that's not gonna change at least i don't see it changing in a foreseeable future but bryce i want to get your take on it what do you think about all this so when you talk about like Oregon and some of these schools like Texas A&M, right? Michigan, bottom line, it seems like they're basically uncomfortable with the pay for play. That's just how it seems it is right now, where they're just basically kind of dipping their toes in the water. And you're seeing Oregon and some of these other schools cannonballing right in the pool. I mean, they're just going all in for it. The thing that's interesting about that, though, and Steve brought this up, is the transfer portal. Because if you look at Texas A&M's number one recruiting class, Sam, that this historic one they signed, half the class is in the portal. So, and I think Michigan's kind of looking at that like, all right, you know, if we're the collectives, if we're going to go into this, why are we going to put money into kids that are going to be here for nine months? Whereas we have proving commodities on campus that can get the job done. Now, here's the interesting thing, and this is kind of where I'm at. If you do take the approach, and I'm leaning towards this side of NIL, you have to target certain positions and certain guys, right? If you look at who beat Ohio State, if you look at who beat some of these guys or some of these teams like Ohio State, Purdue, and competed, against, you know, TCU, who were the main guys? Five-star, J.J. McCarthy. Five-star, Donovan Edwards. Five-star, Will Johnson. You have to have those guys on the roster in order to compete against the big boys in college football. But it doesn't have to be the whole roster. You know, you would love it to be. But if you look at Michigan's history of recruiting over the years, it's never like they signed... 29, five, they, right. they never had that many five stars on their roster to begin with. Bottom line is, if I was Michigan, I would look at probably like quarterback, edge rushers, running back, Corners. certain spots, corner, certain spots you know you have to address. And at the end of the day, when you look at those type of guys, even like a Nicholas Harbor, NIL is going to be a factor. As much as they might not want to say it is it rolls up you got a marketing team all of a sudden i mean i don't know how much jim harbaugh grand newsome ron bellamy all those guys when they walked in for that last in home felt when they see a line of guys that they probably haven't talked to all recruiting cycle now asking him questions about you know so what are you doing with this and Mm -hmm. how's your collectives and what you know what's yeah i guess your plans for this and it's like Michigan, I don't want to say they're unprepared, but it's just not their style. Well, I, you, you know, know, I think I think in that instance, you, you're probably, you know, I don't want to call it denial. I think you're probably, you're surprised and you figure at that point, it's so late in the game that this, the criteria really can't shift this much, right? Right. right. And then you realize, yeah, yeah, it did. I, <clears throat> you know, I think, again, I think that the culture piece is a valid argument. I don't think there's any question. I think it affects NIL is affecting culture now. I mean, A and M is a perfect perfect example. But I think that the nuance that you just brought up, Bryce, is the point. You know, having a more aggressive NIL approach is not saying go into it with a blank checkbook and you're gonna buy every prospect. Like some of these guys. What did Nick Saban say? They bought every guy in the class. I don't think Nick was lying. <laughs> I don't think Nick was lying. 
Now, you know, I, I think you're right. I think be very, very, you know, judicious with with the approach. Target positions that you know to compete for the top guys. They're going to be hearing. They're going to be hearing some some promises, and yeah, I don't know how you do it. So let me be clear. I don't know how you do that. My point is. I don't think Michigan is exploring the how because I think it is so far and away from where they think college athletics should be that, that, you know, we're just going to adhere to the spirit of the rule. And they made some great – so let's let's be clear. They made some great advancements with NIL. We've talked about them. They have four collectives now. They have a new deal in place with with Learfield where Learfield partners with student-athletes, and they're going to bring in – bring athletes deals that come through Learfield IMG and so now you have direct marketing opportunities where you are branding the block M you go look at some of these commercials and shirts they do you don't see Michigan on them this cre- this creates that opportunity so they're doing things they're creating opportunities NIL wise so don't act like they aren't competing in the space but what we're talking about right now is competing in recruiting and can can they get a Blake Corum moving forward, who they beat Ohio State for? Can they get an Aiden Hutchinson moving forward, who they beat in Ohio State for? Can they get a Donovan Edwards moving forward, who they beat Ohio State for? Can they get a, 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 a five-star J.J. McCarthy moving forward, right? Can they get a Will Johnson, who they beat Ohio State for? That becomes the question. Do you have the guys, the, the five-star guys that – when you balance them out, when you add them to all these players that you've developed over time, they put you over the top. That becomes a question. And maybe they can, but I certainly think you gotta you gotta look at it in a cycle like this and when you see the way college football is going. Because here's the other thing. Yes, it's a cultural, it, it becomes a cultural dynamic that you have to manage as a coach. But I can't, it's hard for me to think that it's an impossible task when I watch hard knocks. And I see Aiden Hutchinson get up in front of a room of veterans, and they say, "Hey, Rook, how much did you get? Well, how much was your signing bonus?" And he says, "20 million dollars." And everybody's, "Oh, he gets 20 million dollars." And it's not, and their culture isn't wrecked. Culture isn't jacked up, right? You look, you look at, look at on on coaching staffs. All those guys don't make the same money, right? You you look at staffs. At the, let's just look at the University of Michigan. Jim Harbaugh's not working harder than Bev Plocky. You know, he's not working harder than than whatever other coach you want to look at. Head coach, I mean, these other head coaches are working hard as well, and he is making 10 times, 20 times the amount of money that some of those coaches are making. Is it wrecking the culture? Or have they learned that, hey, look, there are going to be – you're going to be in situations where guys – or people who make more than you. And you got to learn to deal effectively with that. There will be an adjustment period where you got to manage that uh, as a coach. I'm not saying it'll be easy. I'm not saying it's not risky. I'm saying that you're going to have to, I think you're going to be in a place anyway down the line where that's happening. So do you wait for it to be forced upon you like the NCAA? NCAA didn't bring about NIL because they wanted to. They brought it, brought it about because they have to. So do you want to wait for the time where you have to, you know, pay for play, to, so to speak, or, or figure out a way to pay prospects? Or do you want to start being very intentional about exploring the ways where you can do that in selective cases, not to the point where you're doing, you know, maybe they don't get Nick Harbor anyway, to your point, Steve. You aren't going to be, okay, you, you're going for another bid. You know what? Sorry, young fella, we, we're done. But to at least even be in the game where you know this is on the table at such and such a school, I personally don't have any problem with that because since the beginning of amateur sports, what's the ideal has always been arbitrary. At the beginning, it was bad if you worked, right? Only, only rich people could be, you know, amateur athletes because somehow it was – virtuous to not work and play a sport. That's how they excluded the working class. Then it was it was taboo to pay for a scholarship. 
Why should we pay for a, a scholarship for an athlete? That doesn't warrant paying for their education, right? That was taboo. They have always changed what the ideal is arbitrarily to favor them, right? They, they only adopted the scholarship thing because it was, it, was a way to con it was a way to get more talent in and then control labor. So now they're at a point where maybe labor has a little bit more of an advantage. How are they going to shift the ideal to, to preserve this model? That's what NIL is about. So that's why I'm not caught up in this is not how it's supposed to be. No, this is how it is. Is there a way that you can adapt to it is where I am. I'm, I'm off my soapbox. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> I'm no, I'm how about this? How about this? How about this? So let's say they don't take the NIL approach, right? What can they do? to better their recruiting, right? So let's pause, well, let's pause for the class because I want you to pick this up. Too. Let's, let's pick this right. up on the other side because we're going to go a little long in this one, right? So we'll pause for the cause. We'll come back on the other side with more of the Michigan Recruiting Insider. All right, so Bryce, you were saying before the break that assuming that they don't change their approach NIL-wise and they say, you know what? You know, we are going to go at this our way. And how it affects us is how it affects us. We're going to figure out a way to compete for prospects at the same level we did before. So you were saying, what can they do to address it? Where were you going with that? Uh, so I, I'm looking at three bullet points. The first being evaluations. You have to hit on evaluations, and they're going to become more crucial, more critical, and landing guys that maybe aren't the top 100 guys right away. So like a Jason Hewlett. OK, that's a guy that wasn't highly recruited, but Michigan kind of got on him later. You watch his senior film. You 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 just could tell this is going to be a guy that's going to be a player down the road. And overall, he became a four star by 24 seven sports. But that wasn't right away. I mean, he was committed to Cincinnati. He was a guy that didn't have tons of offers, whereas a guy like Nicholas Harbor, he could just pick a squad of a hat and he can go there, you know. I'd say the second thing is relationships. And with that becomes your recruiters. So your staff has to be elite recruiters, in my opinion. Now, if NIL is not a big factor for your school or you or your approach, you have to have great, great relationships. No offense, but you have to have some relationships, guys on the staff, and in terms that reflects your recruiting department, I think that is where Michigan is somewhat, I would say, lacked, but it's hurt them. It's, it hasn't been the same, I would say, since Courtney Morgan and some of those guys have left the program. And the third thing, and Steve kind of hinted at this as well, you have to use the transfer portal. You have to supplement your class if you're not going to hit on certain needs Brandon guys that are maybe proven commodities in college. You know, look at Olu. Look how that turned out. It's you can find success in the transfer portal, but you have to hit on that as well. So those would be the three things. I don't know, Steve and Sam, if you agree on that, where I would look if you don't take any different approach to NIL. Well, Steve, uh, they they definitely did better in the portal this year, and I think that has to that has to continue on an even higher level next year because you got to believe they're thinking right now we got to get a, a quarterback in a portal, like a guy, and because the guy will have an opportunity, assuming J.J. goes to the league, right? Uh, even if you get Jaden Davis, who we'll talk about coming up, do you really want to be in a position of having to start a freshman quarterback? This would be an ideal scenario for a proven commodity quarterback to come in and say, boom. I could come in and play for Michigan for, for this year and improve my draft stock. So you got to believe if what happened this year is an indicator, they could go in the next cycle uh, with hopes of having even a better portal, cl portal class. Quarterback, running back, you know, probably. Uh, there's There are quite a few spots, I think, looking at next year where, where the portal will be the thing. Biggest thing, I mean, not biggest thing, but another thing for me, I, like, yeah, I think an expansion of the – department as a whole uh, you know Michigan has the resources to do some of this stuff without really you know tying it tying his hands 
together. I mean, that, that would be nothing to expand the recruiting department a little bit. Uh, and another thing I think that would take, maybe this yeah. this might be a little too much, but one thing I notice and, uh, uh, other other programs do in a big way that we really don't see much Michigan presence on uh, just more effort to kind of build their recruiting efforts up on a, from a social media standpoint. Uh, Michigan, it feels like has minimal for as big of a program as there and as much success as they've had, just doesn't feel like they have the social media presence uh, from a recruiting standpoint that a lot of other programs do. Uh, you know, I think, I think you're seeing some program. It's to the point where if you have a fan of, of some programs on, on any social media that they are aware of, like, even not quite, maybe not the the casual fan, but even maybe just the the slightly above casual fan knows what guys that Michigan or what guys their school is recruiting, uh, you know, in, in a couple different classes, you know. And I, I just I don't know. I feel like uh, other schools like coaching staffs are a little more active, and these kids are on social media all the time. And and one of the biggest ways you can reel a kid's interest in early is just the attention. Uh, and that doesn't have to be directly from the coaching staff, but they are kind of the initiators of where the, the fan base can really get involved, make a kid feel wanted at a certain school, stuff like that. These are things that would take little to no effort, in my opinion, to like change or, or to push a little bit harder. So, uh, you know, one of those types of things where you see the attention kids get on, on social media can uh, even early on can at least start to pique their interest in a certain program. And I think it's an area where Michigan could, uh, with a bigger recruiting department, uh, could, you know, see some improvement, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think from a recruiting perspective, you said you need to beef up the recruiting prowess uh, of the staff. Especially, look, if you're going to have your hand essentially uh, one arm be tied behind your back with NIL, it, it, it puts the emphasis even more on a staff full of, relationship guys, right? Uh, a, re a recruiting department that has relationship guys. Do you deploy Denar Robinson more effectively, for instance, than, uh, than, than you did in the past? I think that's a very, very valid question. But they've already added one staff member, and that's Kirk Campbell. And I think we can all, before he recruits a single guy, say that's going to be a net positive. <laughs> that's going to be a net positive as a recruiter. Right. I mean, I mean, you could you could make that. And I, I say that I say that no offense, like right. Like Bryce said, no offense. Right. But I'm just taking a page out of Jeremiah Davis's book, the father of Jaden Davis, who said they told Matt Weiss at one point early in the recruitment, you're a terrible recruiter. Here's how you should do it. Right. Well, Kirk, uh, you know, Kirk Campbell comes in and already um, is noted as as a really good relationship guys already reached out to the family. So this, this plays into the discussion we've had a number of times already. Michigan is clearly the front runner for Jaden Davis. Right. And so what's the timeline look like? That's the question that a lot of folks are, are asking where, you know, why are we in a place where, you know, they're still kind of on the, on the hook. Well, I will remind you that, the head coach was just looking at the pros. The quarterback coach, who they got close to after they told him he was a terrible recruiter and he listened to some advice, they they grew to be, you know, really, really tight. He's gone. Jim tells him, I'm going to stay. They hire a new quarterback coach, Kirk Campbell, who they just met for the first time. So there is, there is a getting back on track perspective here, and I think that's where we are now. So I caught up with Jeremiah Davis who talked about his first interaction with Kirk Campbell, which was last Friday. Jaden wound up talking to him last Sunday. And he kind of gave like a, a feel for that first interaction. And then he, he kind of clears the air. I had to cut this interview short because he kind of started go, going off on a tangent. So you'll, you'll hear where I cut it off because he started going off on a tangent about um, false re or, or bad reporting on what the timeline looks like. So this is Jeremiah Davis giving a recap of the interaction with uh, with Kirk Campbell and talking about his son, Jaden, five-star quarterback out of Charlotte Providence Day, talking about his timeline. Here we are with Jeremiah Davis. 
Okay. Yeah, so we chopped it up. It was a little introduction and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, uh, I congratulate him on the position. And uh, and then we went through his whole background, which I already <laughs> probably – I let him go through it, you know, let him let him walk me through his whole background and all those things, and uh, which I already researched to do. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see it, you know, hear it coming from his mouth. So, and uh, we talked about those things, it's like a small little chop it up, try uh, to get to know you mm -hmm. um, type deal. And uh, yeah, so you know, it was cool. And uh, and then uh, we talked about, uh, you know. Uh, talk a little bit more regular, you know, just to get to know each other and things of that nature. So that, that, that's pretty much, you know, about it in, in that front, man. Uh, we talked before you and I talked, and then uh, we talked, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so. Okay. Just to, just to get to know each other and, uh, you know, and do the whole introduction and stuff. And uh, he wanted to let me know that, you know, he's going to be reaching out to Jaden and, and talking and stuff like that, so okay, and ain't really too much to say on that, to be honest. Huh? So what? So so tell me this: What did the Jim or or JJ? I don't know which one you talked to. Probably Jim. What did they say or he say about Kurt Campbell? Um, uh, I know JJ them love. I'm talking to his dad well before this. You know, trying to figure out who's what, what. Um, but uh, I know JJ in the quarterback room loves him. Like he, uh, I guess he really, he's a true quarterback guy. Mm -hmm. He's a quarterback. Well, let me not true. He's a quarterback guy, meaning that he understands um, uh, um, your eyes are where your feet are. So um, what, what footwork goes with what throw uh, and uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he, he just walking, hearing them talk about it and stuff like that, and you know, going on time and with anticipation and stuff like that, um, is some of the things that you know. Uh, but that was part of the conversation I had with him, just testing them, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, um, hearing them talk about, you know, you know the mechanics of the position, uh, you know, I was like, wow. Well, I didn't even told. Him. I said, well, I, so I was like, you know what you're doing, you know. Uh, and then I asked him about, you know, who who. Did he play the position? Of course, he didn't um, at a high level, and uh, but he learned from you know some of the best out there, like Joe Moorhead. If anybody know anything about like college football, he's like uh, a very intelligent and um, uh, uh, quarterback guy, you know, um, um, a strong offensive mind as well. So, you know, naturally matching up uh, the offense to the player and and the mechanics as well so um he, he has he has had some great mentors i would say that to help um you know uh, further his um development as a coach from my offensive standpoint but i think that's huge um uh, being able to relate to the uh to that room and then not and then um being able to um not only relate but um uh, um, be technical, sound, and uh, demonstrating the footwork and all that stuff um, that goes along with each throw. Because we we talked about you know the interception with JJ. You know what I'm saying? I was like, so what are your first things going to be to work on JJ with? And I said, let's let's go back to the um, the playoff game. You know, uh, what did you see? You know, there. You know, we talked about the anticipation, understand, you know, the routes and having the proper threes and footwork and all that stuff that go along with it. So he I don't know if he's just polished or he uh, or whatever, but uh uh he said the the things that you would hope an experienced um quarterback coach slash O C would say, you know what I'm saying? So, right. Yeah, so uh just looking from uh from afar looking at him, but yeah. Okay. All right. So, so now, um, I know when we talked previously, you said that you guys had to sit down and, and determine, had to sit down and figure out a timeline. There's reports out there that say that's already been done and he, and that Jaden is going to be uh, pushing his decision to the spring. That is a false statement. Uh, 
and whoever put that on their little site just to sell clicks should be fired because if you can um, make money off of just being inaccurate, then man, I should be a, a, a lot of us out there should be millionaires because uh, that's just bullshit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to hold back. So this dude is garbage, man. <laughs> You know, if people listen to people that uh, uh, just speculating and stuff like that, they just end it for, you know, they fill us their lives up with rumors. If you want to uh, listen, hear the facts and stuff, then if, if it don't come from me or it don't come from my son, again, it's wrong and, uh, and it's garbage. And who reports stuff like that is garbage. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay so so how about this you know inquiring mm -hmm. minds want to know uh if you haven't determined a timeline yet when do you guys think you will be like what's going to determine this is a better question what's going to determine the timeline what's going to determine when you said it or when he when he decides i'll be honest my, we, we haven't sat down and, and, and talked about that and the reason being is I've been consumed with work. Uh, Jaden's been uh, all over the place, uh, 707 and school and things of that nature. So he's kind of keeping the main thing, the main thing right now. Um, I, I would say, you know, eventually we, we'll sit down and, and talk about it. But um, we haven't even had that conversation, you know. And um, when we have that conversation, uh, uh and then uh, I think the timeline will be uh, it'll be evident. It will be it'll be you know ready to go. Mm -hmm. So um, people talking about spring and fall and winter and Christmas and, and <laughs> Memorial Day and stuff like that, man. Yeah, they're they're reckless and and they're really desperate because nobody wants to talk to them. Uh, and 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 put out false information because they're garbage, <laughs> garbage man. This dude is garbage. I see this dude. I'm gonna, uh, he's garbage, Sam. This dude is garbage. Okay, so um, that was a longer interview that I wound up cutting short because I didn't want the I didn't want the piece to turn into because um, he started naming names and. Look, he, he very clearly has a gripe with another network, and um, I get it. I, I get why he, I get his frustration uh, with what he feels like is um, uh, his, his son's his son's recruitment not being um, covered accurately. I, I, I understand that, but at the same time, I did not want to uh, make the whole thing be about that. I don't want to make the whole thing be about that, but I get where he's coming from and we'll just uh we'll just leave we'll just leave it there cuz I want to focus more so on now they're at a place where I think they were at in December before all the rumors got you know came about. And that is and this is this is a little bit of just a, a more broad kind of recruiting discussion like we had earlier in in the deal. You know, NIL isn't a factor until it is. And so I don't think that that's, at least based on everything that we've heard to this point, I don't think that's the factor for them. I want to make that clear. At the same time, is it, does it become increasingly a factor for, pro for prospects of this ilk? I think, generally speaking, it does, and and so for Michigan, I, I think they're at a crossroads for how how they deal in those types of scenarios, and exploring ways in which they can they can make the they can make the uh, not the promises that others make, but they can make the projection be a little more tangible. They can make it feel a little more likely. They can make it feel a little more certain. I think that that is something that's going to be applicable moving forward. Because, fellas, we said it before, Steve, you get a quarterback in your class and you get a quarterback in your class early, 
it helps everything else. So if, if Michigan could get this wrapped up soon, oh, man, the, the snowball effect, maybe it helps land a guy or move up the timeline for a guy who you just put a crystal ball in for, like a Marion uh, Stewart. Yeah, think about it. Michigan hasn't really had an early quarterback verbal since McCarthy, right? And we remember that that ended up having an impact with some other guys in the class. And you think about where Michigan's at with a, a ton of offensive line prospects right now in 2024. There's a bunch of guys they're in decent shape with. We know who they like at receiver. Uh, they do have the one tight end commitment in Hogan Hansen, but they're in on Brady Prescore and a couple other guys as well. You know, so yeah, I think it's a situation where you you have a, a very visible face and figure to your class, uh, one at an elite level, uh, this early in the process can can definitely, at the very least, again, it's gonna it's going to seriously peak interest from other guys. Then it's on Michigan to sort of close the deal with some with some prospects. So yeah, I mean, getting getting Jane Davis in the fold, I think we talked about would be uh, significant no matter when they get him. But the earlier you can get a guy like that on board, the the better it could end up being for your class as a whole. Yeah, uh, you know, Michigan just made the top four, Steve, for a one of the top talents on their board at the running back position, Jordan Marshall. Uh, you know, another guy. I mean, just you feel like you get that quarterback in the class, it can be a it can be a domino, and you see a running back. Could it be that running back quarterback dynamic that we just saw with JJ and Donovan? You just you start to imagine possibilities like that, and again. Similar dynamic in that this is a, a, a running back prospect that you you are going to have to wind up beating Ohio State for. So was it, yeah, Michigan, Ohio State, Tennessee, Wisconsin. Uh, this feels like it'd be a Michigan, a classic Michigan, Ohio State battle. Uh, and it, it kind of feels like it's been a little bit since the two schools have really gone squared up head to head uh, for a big time prospect. Uh, yeah, Michigan, don't get it wrong, Ohio State's had tons and tons of success at the running back position over the last 10 to 12 years. I mean, we know Michigan, uh, their identity is much more about running the football than Ohio State's has been, but Ohio State has pumped out a lot of really good players at the position. So both both schools have a nice pitch. I think him being from Cincinnati helps Michigan just because I don't think Cincinnati is the uh, diehard Ohio State area necessarily that a lot of other major cities in, in the state of Ohio are. Uh, but that being said, I think Ohio State, you know, clearly Michigan's biggest competition in this one. I think one thing for Michigan, uh, depth chart could be a could could play in their advantage actually because we know. I mean, what we had the Donovan Edwards has explicitly said that this is it, right? <laughs> and Blake Corum would not, obviously would would not be back again after this season. So you know, it, it it's on Michigan. Either somebody's got to step up below those two guys or. Whoever they recruit in 2024, uh, maybe if they get the right guys, could be in a position to play right away. I mean, I think Jordan Marshall's a guy that plays right away at Michigan, even if a guy steps up for Michigan that that's not Donovan Edwards or Blake Corum this season. So, you know, him and probably what Taylor Tatum, the other one, another guy, both those guys are year one guys at Michigan, uh, no doubt. So, yeah, I mean, I think each school has a little bit of an uh, – they have their – plays that they're going to make, but it does feel like a, a classic Michigan-Ohio State battle uh, for, a, for a top 50-level prospect. And I kind of jumped over you, Bryce, and talking about Amarion Stewart. You put in a crystal ball for Amarion a little while ago. Uh, I know you've talked to Taylor Tatum. I mean, these these offensive prospects that, again, you get your quarterback in the fold, something your odds go, go way up, and they're pretty high, especially for Amarion, who I know you like Michigan for. Yeah, he's a four-star wide receiver out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and Sam, we actually met, had him in the studio. And we talked to him and his mom. It was pretty evident, I mean, since talking to him in the studio, but even before that, that he really liked Michigan. And not only why he liked Michigan was because of Ron Bellamy, the wide receivers coach, which he made a point-blank clear. He has a great relationship with him. And so... He knows guys on the team. You know, you got the Illinois connection with J.J. already there, um, A.J. Henning, Trevor Keegan. I mean, the list goes on of Illinois prospects on the current roster. But 
he seemed to really come away from a good bond with not only the players on the team, the coaching staff, everything, the culture, everything Michigan offers. He seems to really like, I know he's got a current top seven. He made it very clear to us though, that that might not be his final seven. That's just his current top seven. But I like where Michigan sits. He's been up to campus several times. He's been up for game day visits. Um, The Michigan state game was one. I think he came up for an, another game earlier than that. Then he came up for the barbecue. He's even camped at Michigan. So he's experienced it all. And this is a guy that is very high on Michigan's board. I mean, when he did camp, Michigan kind of threw him, put him through the ringer, and he passed all the tests with flying colors. I mean, this is a guy they really liked. And I know, Sam, you talked about the last podcast. Once he kind of cleared the checkpoints in terms of the camp and how well he did. He was hanging out with Jane Davis. He was hanging out with the Providence Day crew. And so that kind of is reading the tea leaves sort of saying, hey, this is going to be a guy we really want in the class. And obviously I put in a crystal ball. Steve, I think he put in one. And I don't know if you're close, but I think you're thinking about it. So, I, look, I think Michigan it definitely leads for Amarion Stewart. I, I, I think Look, if you if you put them, if you made them so they had to answer the question, I think it would be Michigan. Here, my only pause with the crystal ball is right now he isn't thinking about making a decision. He's talking about pushing it all the way out to uh, the early signing period, maybe even the late signing period of a senior. So maybe even a year from now, and that's that's my reluctance. Kind of wanting him, waiting to see for him to to, to get out how he reacts to being more places. I, I think it's a steep hill for another school to climb, but I don't think it's impossible. So I think you guys are on point when you say Michigan is the clear favorite. I'm just a little more look, you guys are younger than me. So you you know you're you're more of a risk taker. You're you're bigger risk takers than than I am. I tend to be a little more conservative with my crystal ball calls, but I think that you guys are spot on with saying Michigan leads and if we were closer to signing day i absolutely would put it in and i still may go early i that's how how much i feel like michigan is out front but uh but the timing you know and and maybe maybe getting some others in the fold will be momentum guys in the fold like the young man who just committed today and this is a great way to conclude this podcast jacob Oden bryce who we have thought from the beginning even when maybe he was leaning to michigan state for a brief period of time, even then, I thought, let's say he had committed to, to Michigan State. Let's say he had silently committed to Michigan State. I didn't think it was going to stick. I always thought that Jacob Oden would wind up at Michigan. The ties just run way too deep for him to wind up someplace else. Jacob Oden, Michigan's latest commitment. Yeah, so this guy, six foot one, 108 pounds from Harper Woods, Michigan, uh, composite four star across the board. Every you know network looks at him as a four star. Had over thirty offers. Came down to the top five. I want to say Michigan and Michigan State. I would say Penn State, and Tennessee were the main schools in the mix there. And Sam, like you hinted at, at one point he had crystal balls favoring Michigan State after his spring game visit to East Lansing this past year, and a lot of people just. I don't want to say they assumed he was going there, but I think it was a nice way of saying I think Michigan State leads at this point. Maybe that that they weren't going to get him, get him, but at least they led at that point. But Steve Klinkscale, big props to him. This was a recruitment. He's and this is a family he's known for years. You know, this is not someone new, um, and he had been working on this recruitment very hard. He's got a very good relationship, not only with Jacob, but with his father, Rod, um, that goes back years since when he started recruiting, I want to say, at Kentucky, maybe even before that. Um, this was a school and a guy he always talked to and uh, looked at for prospects. And overall, I think it was just the comfortability of Michigan. You know, he knows a lot of guys on the roster. I remember when I went to see Will Johnson, his signing a couple years ago in Detroit, Jacob Bowden was at it. You know, that's how much he really looks at those guys and really cares for them as well. So overall, great pickup. This is now, I want to say, the fifth fifth four-star 
in the six man class of Michigan right now. It's hovering around the top 10 range. And the biggest thing is, I think, you know, we, we pointed out talking about the 2023 class, the pressure that it might right now applies to this 2024 class. Well, they're off to a great start. And this is a guy that I think when you look at where he fits to, I would consider him a defensive athlete more in the back end because he can play corner. He can play safety. He could even play some nickel. And we, Sam, you and me have seen him at several uh, camp settings where he's moved around. He's done certain things, but a very fluid with the hips, got great ball skills. He's got good speed and he's got a high football IQ. And that's the type of guy that fits exactly what Steve Klingscale is looking for at the back end of his defense. Steve, uh, Jacob Oden, Michigan's latest pickup. Good to get a four-star instator. Uh, yeah, this was one I think if we at the beginning of the cycle or when things got, I think this was a guy we probably felt like Michigan was going to get or, you know, it would have been a at least a mild surprise if he had committed elsewhere. Uh, yeah, like Bryce said, the versatility in the defensive backfield, I think, is the, the biggest asset here. Um, and a guy, you know, like I said, a guy that we've already talked about for so long, I don't I don't feel like down the road is going to end up getting the due as far as how big of a part of the class uh, he really is. I mean, we know Michigan really likes guys that can can move around in the defensive backfield, uh, you know, and, and Odin uh, really adds to that. And, yeah, I mean, the whole Michigan State stuff, I think we've talked about that a couple times I mean, maybe he must have had a good visit there the one time or something. But uh, this was one it felt like when Michigan wanted to kind of put the pedal of the metal, uh, they were going to be in control of. So, yeah, you know, one thing real quick, I saw Ohio. I saw an article about Ohio State focusing more regionally because of NIL, right? So, uh, you know, I got to think, you know, Michigan in a at least somewhat of a similar, like you got to, you can't let guys like this, you know, end up elsewhere, right? So. In a way, you know, a much a very very big commitment in that regard too. Because if you have guys that can play in your backyard, of course you always want those guys. But there, I think there might be even a little bit more pressure to land some of those guys now uh, because you're not going to, at least at this time and place right now, you're not going to get into the 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 you know you're not going to go deep with the Oregon's, the Texas A&M's, the Miami's, the Louisville's, all those schools right now. You know, so so getting a guy like Odin, a legitimate across the board four star. An important position is 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 bigger for Michigan than I think people might initially believe or, or see. Yeah, you you raise a great point that gets back to our previous discussion. People need to know most campuses, most fan bases in the country are complaining about NIL, including Ohio State's. They don't think that their NIL is good enough, which is crazy when you consider that they're more aggressive with their NIL than say Michigan. There's just there's there's no with their approach, I should say. But even they are having to adjust. I mean, they are all they've always been a nationally recruiting team, but they're realizing that because of NIL, there are certain recruitments because you can't you just can't be you, you can't go as hard NIL wise with your entire recruiting class. It's just not that's no one can do it except for maybe A&M. But no one else can. Can do that. I said maybe, right? Uh, but they realize regional has to be more of an emphasis. What has Michigan been doing over the last couple of years anyway? Illinois, Ohio has become more of an emphasis. With Kirk Campbell, Pittsburgh or uh, PA is going to become more of an emphasis. DMV, this, this sort of area, this region that has fed Michigan for as long as we've been watching them becomes a greater emphasis in the recruiting dynamic, I think even more so in the NIL uh, era. And to your point also, Steve, look, Jacob Oden is a guy you have to get. He's a legacy. His parents are Michigan alums, right? He grew up a Michigan fan. His dad was not going to push him to Michigan. He sent guys all over the place. Desmond King, Cedric Lattimore, all those guys go to Iowa, right? They were, you know, Iowa is a top school on his list. But at the end of the day, you know, Michigan had an advantage with this one, and you got to get him. And I agree with you, Bryce. He he can be a chess piece on the back end. Uh, he's athletic enough to play some at corner. He's a coach's kid, so he's a high IQ player. He can play corner, nickel, and safety. I think 
he'll start out as a as a safety and see where things go. And he could be the quarterback of your defense. I just think he's a really, really versatile guy, a really heady guy, and a leader on your back end, and maybe a leader in this recruiting class, because we can close out with this. You know, you got to recruit your state. You want to have some momentum. I think Jacob Oden helps you with Jeremiah Beasley. And I think Jeremiah Beasley is a ball player. Jeremiah Beasley out of Belleville, you say, oh, Belleville. Yeah, you can't. They are getting a Belleville kid. Jeremiah Beasley's dad is a huge Michigan fan. Jeremiah Beasley, if you ask me, because he named his top five, I'm going to get my opinion on the matter. He did not say this, but you got Pitt in his, in his final five, uh, Kentucky, Michigan State, where his brother Malik Carr plays, Tennessee, and Michigan. Personally speaking, I think it's Tennessee and Michigan. I think that those are the, the top schools on his list, and you got – uh, you know, you got a a Detroit native, uh, a King alum, um, you know, running the defense over there that he has known forever in Tim Banks uh, that you're recruiting against. And so, you know, you need some you need some tools in the kit to to kind of beat down an SEC team that a lot of kids around here are familiar with. But I think you have the ammunition to do it there as well. So that's another big recruitment. He's going to be announcing his decision on um, on March 15th. And I don't think he's made his mind up yet between those five. I just handicapped him who I told you I thought were the top two on his list. But that doesn't mean he'll definitely wind up at one of those two. I just, I'm just telling you where I think Michigan is in the mix right now. And that is a big time target in the 24 class for Michigan. He is the uh, according to our guys, number 156 in the country, and number 13 linebacker nationally. So another top 247 player uh, that Michigan could land here in the spring. So we'll see how it goes. But I know it was a long episode, but fellas, I feel like it was warranted that that we get you know a little a little more a little deeper into the equation there, right? So that's gonna do it for this episode. If you missed any aspect of the coverage of any of the guys that we talked about, I suggest you go over to the MichiganInsider.com. Subscribe right now. One dollar gets you in your first month. And once you become a full-paying member, you get access to Paramount Plus as a part of your subscription. You can't, be, you can't beat it. Of course, if you just want to hang out on a podcast, that's fine. Be sure to like the podcast. Be sure to subscribe to it. Be sure to tell all your friends about it. They can find it wherever they get their podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, you name it. And, of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, help the channel grow. Be sure to like the videos. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. That's how you keep us growing. That's how you keep us coming back for another episode of the Michigan Recruiting Insider.